All right, I think we're live. So, hey everyone, welcome to the 13th uh, e-seminar, active and based e-seminar series. And um, today we are delighted to have a PhD student from the University of West Indies, uh, based in Jamaica. Um, her name is Eleanor Terralong, and she's gonna be talking to us today about Jamaican actinomycetes, new weapons against antibiotic resistance. Um, so Eleanor, welcome. Um, just before you get started, I'm just going to say, guys, if you can hang around at the end after the questions, um, as we'll have a little announcement to make, uh, that's quite important. So uh, I'll see you then. But Eleanor, for now, over to you. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for inviting me. Let me just share my screen. All right. So hello, everyone. As Tom said, my name is Eleanor Terrellong. I'm a PhD student at the University of the West Indies, Mona, based in Jamaica. And my research is basically exploring Jamaican actinomycetes as new weapons against antibiotic resistance. So um, just a quick background about how we des designed this study and how we sort of decided what direction to go with it. There's no information on actinomycetes in Jamaica or on the wider in the wider Caribbean. Um, and we know that we have the potential for new species and strains here. So of course there is a potential for new antimicrobial compounds. So what we really wanted to do with this research is build a sort of database of Jamaican actinomycetes to just get an idea of what we have, what possible compounds could be produced and it definitely set the stage for future work. So my study is basically, it's split up into three main parts. First of all, we look at the diversity and morphology of our actinomycetes. Then we look at the molecular characterization of what we have. And then we started to explore antimicrobial agents from our isolates. So let me talk about the diversity and morphology first. Um, for this research, we employed the an antibiotic resistance screening method, which was designed by Thaka et al, um, basically to identify potential antibiotic producing strains of bacteria. Um, and it is based on the self-protection mechanism that antibiotic producers have. So they'll be resistant to whatever antibiotic they produce, of course, so that they don't die during production. So what this entails is growing target organisms in media containing the antibiotic that we're exploring. And for my research, we're focusing on vancomycin and vancomycin type antibiotics. So of course, only organisms that are resistant to vancomycin will be able to grow and will be able to identify these as most likely vancomycin producers. So this is just a schematic of the antibiotic resistance screening method taken from the same FACAL paper in 2011. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is the total number of isolates at the top. We put them through the antibiotic resistance filter and be able to pick out those that are resistant to the glycopeptide antibiotic. And then we do a molecular fingerprint filter to identify the most likely unique and novel glycopeptide antibiotic producers. For my research, I took soil samples from five locations in five parishes. In Jamaica, we have 14 parishes in total. I started with five parishes on the eastern end of the island, um, and I took soil samples from five locations in each of those parishes, just random soil samples, made soil suspensions with them, and did spread plates on Streptomyces isolation media. From that, we picked unique colonies and spread them out on plates to obtain pure cultures. And as I would have mentioned, these spread plates would have had vancomycin within the media. But in addition to exploring the antimicrobial producers, I would have mentioned that we are trying to compile a database of all actinomyces that we have in the soil. So we also street them out on non-vancomycin plates just to ensure that we had representation of all of the actinomyces that we could then sequence and identify down the road. So as I'm sure everyone knows, actinomycete colonies are very diverse. They can be the typical fuzzy or chalky white or yellow colonies that we're used to. They can be pink, red, or orange, small cream colored colonies. And a number of actinomycetes are actually pigment producing. So the pigments might be red, blue, green, orange, black, brown, and so on. So these are some of the photos of just a couple of my isolates. And you can see that we ended up with a wide variety of morphologies. We have some that are the typical fuzzy red, fuzzy white appearance in the middle. 
Um, the one over on the right hand side here, it's you can see that it's orange. Um, these two look sort of black. And then here in the bottom left corner, we actually have a pigment producing isolate. So if you look, you can actually see it's producing a green pigment that is coloring the agar. So after we did the spread plates, we ended up with 224 isolates. Now the original plan was to do all 14 parishes, but after the first five and we ended up with so many isolates, we decided to just focus on these. And I have a lab partner that is exploring the parishes on the Western side of the island. So by the time we're finished, we should have a complete picture of actinomycete population in Jamaican soils. So once we did that, now we now move to the molecular characterization of the isolates. Started with RET PCR studies. So RET PCR, repetitive element sequence based PCR, is used to eliminate repeat strains. And we did this to ensure that we are not wasting time and reagents testing the same isolates over and over. What this does, as I said, it reduces the chance of rediscovery of known molecules and increases the likelihood of isolating novel microbes and compounds because we're able to put more attention to each isolate so that we um, cut down on the time, cut down on the reagents in isolating new compounds. It takes advantage of short repetitive sequence elements that are scattered throughout an organism's genome. And for this, we use the box A1R primal. Box elements, there are sections of repeat DNA, and they're found in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So for the box air PCR, we use a single primer listed there to target these box elements. And the primer will bind to the box elements and amplify the sections of DNA in between the box motifs to generate a banding pattern based on these sections. And then the banding pattern is what we use to identify unique species or strains of bacteria. So a schematic on the red PCR studies here in one, um, you see these blue rectangles. So these would represent the box motifs and the box primer will bind to the box region on the genome and then copy the DNA in between the box motifs. And it's this DNA that is then multiplied in PCR. And that's how we end up with a banding pattern that looks like this when we run it on an electrophoresis gel. So this is an example of just one of my gels. As you can see here, we have a number of different banding patterns. So this one here, you can see that it's different from the rest of them. And this would indicate that this particular isolate D33 is a unique strain when compared to the others. And then we have this group of isolates here that look similar. So we can say, okay, these are similar strains or similar species of bacteria. But if you actually look closely, you will see that there is some variation with the banding pattern. So some of them have extra bands in places that are not in the others. And what this indicates is that, they, as I said, they might be of similar species, but they're likely of different strains. So in order to analyze these banding patterns, instead of doing it by hand, which we were doing at first, we use the Gel J image software V2, which was developed at the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science of La Rioja in Spain. This is an open source free software. And what it does, it groups the isolates based on each banding pattern. And then we use that to develop a dendrogram. So this is a screenshot from the program. I'm sure people have used this program or similar programs. And basically what it does, it just allows you to upload your gels, um, identify the size of the bands for each isolate. And then the program will run its mathematics on all of that and produce a dendrogram that you can then look at and analyze any relationships between the isolates and what it actually enables us to do is to pick out banding patterns that are the same so we can identify isolates that are the same eliminate the repeat strain and then move forward with only one of those so this is a little snippet of the dendrogram and what you can see here is that at each of these areas you find that so for example at the top the banding pattern for b324 would be the same as the banding pattern for B317. And both of them come from St. Thomas. So what this tells us is that these two isolates are the same. So moving forward with the research, we only need to use one of them. And you see similar um, clustering further down. So this is just a little snippet of the um, dendrogram because all of it couldn't fit. Um, and we also verified that this was accurate once we moved into the sequencing data. 
So the dendrogram confirmed that the microbes isolated from the soil samples are extremely diverse. And we wanted to see if there was any relationship between the location of the samples with um, the, the isolates actually identified. We didn't notice any specific clustering by parish or location, which tells us that the actinomycete species are widespread throughout the different locations across at least the eastern end of the island. Then we sort of narrowed it down by parish just to see if there is any other um, pattern that we can identify in the clustering of isolates within a specific parish. Now, first we looked at Kingston and St. Andrew, which is a very urban area. Kingston is actually the capital of Jamaica. Um, we have a number of hospitals actually, or campuses adjacent to a teaching hospital. So what we saw from Kingston and St. Andrew is that we had most of the vancomycin resistant isolates coming from this parish. Additionally, when we look at the dendrogram, you see that there are these two specific boxes, box A and box D. And we found that within these quote unquote boxes is where we found most of our vancomycin resistant and pigment producing isolates. Within B, we found that all of the pig or most of the pigment producing isolates clustered within this little box. And within box C, all of these isolates were vancomycin resistant. We then looked at St. Mary. Now St. Mary is a very, very rural area much different from Kingston and St. Andrew. And we had a lot less vancomycin resistant and pigment producing isolates. And all of them clustered together towards the bottom of the dendrogram. Similarly for St. Anne, we had our vancomycin resistance isolate clustering together-ish. And then we had our pigment producers scattered throughout. St. Thomas, again, a very rural area. We had a few vancomycin resistant isolates within this box here and one pigment producer. So now that we did all of that, we now needed to identify exactly what kind of actinomycetes we had. And we did this through 16S rDNA sequencing to identify the most likely genus and species. Did this using 27F and 1492 primers. Again, this is, I couldn't fit all of them on the slide, but this is just a representation of some of my isolates. And what we were able to see is that we had isolates across a number of families within the Actinomycetales um, area. So up the top, I've actually put in some research strains as well, sorry, reference strains as well, just to sort of get an idea of the relationship between my isolates and what is already out there. So we had some Streptomyces, we had um, some in the Micrococcusae family. We had uh, Mycosilibacterium species here. And we had a number in the Micromonosporaceae family. We also had four isolates here that actually didn't show similarity to anything within the BLAST database. Um, and we're considering the possibility that these may actually be novel species or novel strain. So we have prepared these for whole genome sequencing. That part is still to be completed so we can identify exactly what it is or be able to generate a sequence that we can then move forward to registering as a novel species. So now that all of that was done, we know what we have. We know what the actinomycetes look like. We move to the meat of the matter, which is really what kind of antimicrobial agents can we get from our Jamaican actinomycetes. So I'm sure everybody here knows that actinomycetes are the antibiotic producers. And of the 20,000 biologically active antimicrobials that have been identified, 45% of them have been isolated from actinomycetes. Therefore, it's very important for us to know the diversity of actinomycetes in Jamaica, because as I mentioned, if we do have novel strains, there is a possibility that we have novel antimicrobial compounds as well. Antimicrobials are usually produced as secondary metabolites or cellular compounds within bacteria. Both primary and secondary metabolites are produced from microorganisms when they're grown in large batch cultures. Um, and during batch culture, organisms undergo two major phases. First phase is trophophase, which is just the bacteria growing up on its own, getting all happy. And then the second phase is idiophase. This is the production phase. So once the bacteria have reached maturity, they start to pro produce secondary metabolites or compounds that are not necessarily essential to their growth. Growth, And this is where you will see compounds such as antimicrobials and antibiotics being produced. So 
we spoke about the self-protection mechanism earlier, and this is the same principle that applies to the ideal phase and the trophal phase um, differences. And this is because microorganisms might be sensitive to their produced antibiotic while they're growing up, but it's only upon when they've completed trophal phase and they've reached maturity that they actually acquire resistance to whatever antibiotic they're producing. So of course, it wouldn't make sense for them to be producing this toxic antibiotic before they are able to acquire resistance to it. So for my research, we started by extracting the cellular compounds. So after we did the replication and we identified, um, we narrowed down our 224 isolates to 88. We then chose the isolates which showed the most potential for antimicrobial activity and set them up for large, um, large scale fermentation cultures. We used molasses as a substrate. We also did a couple using maltose as a substrate just to see if there was a difference between the metabolites produced when you change the substrate for fermentation. In order to choose the isolates that we thought showed the most potential for antimicrobial activity, we selected all the vancomycin resistant isolates, all the pigment producing isolates, and we did some initial antimicrobial testing of just the culture versus some pathogenic cultures. Anything that showed activity, we moved forward with extracting the compounds and metabolites from them. After we set up the fermentation, we centrifuged the cultures, and we kept half for the extraction of intracellular and extracellular compounds, and we kept the other half for extraction of secondary metabolites. So we did a methanol extraction for the intracellular compounds and a chloroform extraction for the extracellular compounds. Then we moved to testing our compounds against various pathogens. And as you can see here, I have a list of some of them. Since um, this part of the research was completed, we've actually added two candida species because we want to explore the antifungal activity of the compounds as well. And as you can see, we have a mix of both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria to sort of, I guess, widen the scope and see just kind of what compounds we have and what shows activity. So we have E. coli, we have S. aureus, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, Listeria, and so on and so forth. We did the antimicrobial assay using the agar well diffusion method. So we poured plates with the culture on miller hinton agar we punched eight millimeter diameter wells onto the plates and we actually varied the volume of compound that we added to each. So we did 10 microliters, 50 microliters and 100 microliters. And we did this just to get some preliminary information that would help us when we move to doing the um, MIC calculations, minimum inhibitory concentration, just to figure out how much of each antimicrobial compound is actually needed to show inhibitory activity. The plates were incubated for 24 hours at 37 degrees, and then we looked for inhibition of the growth. And of course, we did a control plate using known antibiotics, vancomycin, tetracycline, and ampicillin. So this is just a photo of one of my plates. And as you can see here, we're noticing a zone of inhibition, which is the clear area around the well um, with a 100 microliter of this, the compound, a smaller zone of inhibition for the 50 microliters and no inhibition for the 10 microliters. So this would be a quote unquote positive antimicrobial result. Um, so we know that the intracellular compounds from isolate D3V1 shows inhibitory activity against S. aureus. Now this we would have done with just the crude compound. And of course, <coughs> sorry, the crude compound, and then we would move forward as I'm gonna explain in a minute. So this is just an outline of those that we've tested so far. As I mentioned, this is still a work in progress. So I'm only presenting the results that we have completed. Um, so we had 11 isolates showing activity against gram positive bacteria only, two against gram negative bacteria only. Five of them seem to be broad spectrum. So they show activity against both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. 14 of our isolates didn't show activity to any of the pathogens that we tested against. So just a quick kind of outline of intracellular versus extracellular compounds. So from our intracellular compounds, 89% of them were gram positive, showed activity against gram positive strains only. Um, one of them, 11% gram negative only. Um, for extracellular compounds, again, we had most of them showing activity against gram positive bacteria. Um, and then four of them against both gram positive and gram negative. So that is where we ended up with our 
broad spectrum um, antimicrobials and three of them against gram negative bacteria only. Now we are expecting most of them to have activity against gram positive bacteria because vancomycin itself works against gram positive bacteria. So it follows that if we are looking for vancomycin type compounds and we're expecting them to show activity that is similar to vancomycin. Um, but as I said, we didn't only use the vancomycin resistant isolates. So we also used some pigment producers and some that just showed antimicrobial activity. And this is where we saw them having activity against other types of bacteria. So the gram negative bacteria and the broad spectrum. I can also say that um, very preliminary results, we did see some inhibitory activity against our candida species, but I won't be presenting that today. So ongoing work, I'm almost finished. Um, so I've already done ethyl acetate extraction of the secondary metabolites to move to the final antimicrobial testing. And what we're doing with the metabolites is not just testing the crude extracts, but we're also purifying them using chromatography um, to be able to identify exactly which compound within the metabolites is producing the antimicrobial activity. Once we've done that, we will be doing chemical identification of each of the compounds using VLC, FTIR and NMR studies. And this will tell us exactly what compound is causing the activity. And if it is a new compound, then we'll be able to deduce the structure of the compound to move forward with any other kind of work, whether it's manufacturing it, whether it's exploring it some more. This will also give us an idea if there are any additional compounds within the metabolites, because we know that actinomycetes also have use as for plant growth promotion, for example. So if there are compounds in there that help, we hope that we will at least be able to identify what is present within Jamaican actinomycetes and what potential there is to extract other compounds from them. As I said, we'll be doing MIP calculations to determine the minimum inhibitory concentration, how much of the antimicrobial compounds is needed to actually cause an inhibitory effect and we are working on biosynthetic gene cluster analysis. For this part of the work, it's within the molecular characterization, and we're looking at the gene cluster responsible for the production of vancomycin, which is the OxyC gene cluster. And we, what we want to see is that if we only do gene cluster analysis, so if we test for the genes within the OxyC gene cluster, the OxyE, DPGE, OxyA, OxyB genes, will we be able to predict um, antimicrobial producers without having to go through the chemistry aspect of it. Um, so what we kind of want to do is, is bolster the validity of the study by looking at both and then ensuring or hoping that um, the, the, the re results correlate with each other, that our gene cluster information can be used as an alternative to identifying antimicrobial compounds. And of course, it will also, again, all back to the big picture of actinomyces in Jamaica, it will give us information as to what biosynthetic gene clusters are present within Jamaica actinomyces and set the, the stage for future or ongoing work. So that's it for me. Um, I hope I wasn't, I didn't go too fast. These are my references. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Hopefully they won't be too hard. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Jamaican Labrat. Thanks, Eleanor. That was that was really great, really great talk. Um, so while well, we're just waiting for some questions to filter in, um, I'll start with one of my own. So um, you said you had was it two hundred and twenty four isolates or so? Yes. Um, and how many of those in the end ended up being actinomycetes? Um, we still have about twenty that we have to do gene. Um, sequencing on but of the so we ended up with 88 after the dereplication so 88 is the pool we have yeah. about 20 that are left so of the rest of them it was about 44 i think and then we had some other species we had some bacillus species we actually found uh but two vancomycin resistant enterococci species which was a little concerning um yeah so um but yeah most of them turned out to be actinomyces with a couple others Awesome. Um, so we have a question from, well, we have a few questions from Gertie. So I'll start with the first one. She says, um, right. hi, great talk, Helena. Did you do any characterization of the soils you use for the plating? Right. So we, we did. We collected pH information, um, the type of soil itself, 
we didn't i noticed um the only correlation i noticed was within the ph of the soils um so we had more isolates coming from the neutral to alkaline ph soils as opposed to the more acidic soils but we didn't really notice any correlation when it came to soil type like loamy versus clay clay soil um that sort of thing but yes we did we do have that information awesome so now we have a, a question from lorena so lorena says great talk emma which of your isolates do you think is the most interesting so far and why so i have one isolate that has shown activity against everything that i have tested it against all of our pathogens all gram negative gram positive um so that particular isolate i'm i'm very you know i'm holding that one close to my heart i'm hoping that that's where we can get the most information from yeah we all have that one isolate we love don't we um so uh Andres says, hi, amazing talk. I was wondering when using the rep PCR, how many of the 200 isolates were duplicated strains? Is that where you got that 80 or so after de replication? 30 with 224 and we narrowed it down to 88. Wow. From, yeah, from the de rep. Just for doing some simple PCRs. It, yes. Yeah. So we didn't have to take all of the 220. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, that's a lot of 16 you know, sequencing, but PCR yeah. wise, it's not so bad. Hey, I like that. Um, uh, and Keita asks, hey, nice talk, a uh, few questions. What was the reason for choosing vancomycin? Um, what was all of that? What, what, why vancomycin specifically? Um, well, we had to start somewhere. That, that's really what it was. Um, and the, the Thaco paper that we had found actually used vancomycin as a base. We know that vancomycin is now being, it's a almost last resort, but with antimicrobial resistance increasing, we see more clinical applications of vancomycin. Um, it, it seemed, it's still effective and it shows a, what am I trying to say? It shows a lower rate of acquiring antibiotic resistance than some of the other antibiotics. So that's where we started with vancomycin. Cool. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sam. So he says, um, of your potential novel species, how do they compare morphologically to the other isolates? And did these strains show much antimicrobial activity? Okay, so of the four, um, three of them showed antimicrobial activity. One of them was actually vancomycin resistant. In terms of morphologically, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but they, they weren't, they weren't similar to each other. So they were scattered throughout the, the morphology of the rest of them. I didn't notice anything particularly interesting about their morphology per se. Cool. Uh, another question from Gertie. She asks, um, were vancomycin resistant strains equal, better or worse at producing interesting antimicrobials compared to the vancomycin sensitive ones? Um, they were, but actually I found the most activity from the pigment producing strains, which is telling us that there's definitely something in there. Um, we, most of the, the antimicrobial producers were in fact vancomycin resistant, which is what we expected as well, but yes. Cool. Uh, probably the, in terms of time, probably the last question we'll have is Alili asks, did you find any amycelial strains such as those belonging to the micro uh, Cochier, um, showing any antimicrobial bioactivity. Yes, we have two within that's that. Really cool. that um, yeah, so that, that's exciting. I'm, in, I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so I think in terms of time, we'll probably hold it there for questions. If you have any more, like Eleanor says, she's on Twitter. Um, so just go tweet at her and uh, get, some, get some answers to those questions you have. Thank you once again. Really awesome talk. Um, really enjoyed that. And um, yeah, thank you. So as I said now, yeah, no. Um, as I said, just a little announcement to make um, for everyone. So unfortunately, um, this is probably, well, this is going to be the last Actinobase e-seminar for this series. Um, Myself, the rest of the committee, we're all coming into pretty pivotal parts of, of, a, of our PhDs. Most of us are final years, um, and we probably, having lost so much time to lockdown, probably not going to have much time to maintain the seminar series for the rest of this year. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look to recruit a new team to run the series uh, when the seminars start up again. That will be completely down to them. We found it worked really well in this, in this well, lockdown. Hopefully we don't have that next year, but um, next summer or, you know, whenever they feel like it, it's completely down to them. We'll be around to kind of help and give advice, but we want to hand it over to some new people, fresh energy. Um, we 
we've loved doing this. It's been great fun. It's been great having loads of speakers. Really enjoyed it. Oh, we hope you have too. We've been really thankful to everyone who's tuned in every week and, you know, hopefully you've enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. We know we've listened to a lot of speakers um, who we wouldn't normally hear. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be looking for this new committee. We're really keen to make sure this new um, the new committee reflects the diversity of the actinomycete research community, as we've seen in all our talks, um, and has representatives from around the globe. So hopefully we can assist, establish a system where these seminar series will, uh, the committee is refreshed every year. Um, so if you think any of you ECRs listening, or if there are any ECRs in your group that you know of that may be interested, um, just please get in touch uh, on Twitter, send us an email, you know, however you want to do it. Um, I'll also send around an email maybe tomorrow, maybe start of next week, just to the mailing list so everyone knows as well for those who haven't been able to watch this one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been great, guys. Really, thank you so much. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all those who have listened. And I look forward to seeing this with the next committee setting up. So that's all for now today. Just a big thank you again to Eleanor and everyone watching and the committee. Everyone's been great. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again soon. All right. Cheers.